Thank you all for joining us for the ASNIC um, two-week virtual nuclear cardiology elective. This is week two, day one, and today we have with us Dr. Paco Bravo from UPenn. He'll be discussing about myocardial viability and showing a, showing a number of cases. So Paco, you're on now. Thank you for uh, teaching the fellows. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Dorbala, so much for the invitation. Uh, myself, uh, Michael Ayers, and, and Vivek Kulani from the University of Pennsylvania are so pleased to um, be actually part of these uh, webinar sessions uh, during these difficult times. So uh, my, our job today, uh, for the first 30 minutes uh, of this two-hour uh, session, is going to be focused on, on talking about viability assessment with FDG PET. It's, it's going to be more like a practical talk. Uh, and it's gonna be case-based as well as we go over. After those uh, 30 minutes are uh, um, over, then we're gonna proceed with uh, more um, general cardiology, nuclear cardiology cases uh, that are gonna be run by our fellows. And so feel free to ask any questions in the chat. Uh, Mike and, 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 and Vidic will be actually uh, paying attention to the questions and we'll try to address those questions as they come. Okay, what are the definition of viability? So if you actually look it up on the dictionary, viability is the ability to continue to exist, ability to live or to succeed, and the ability to survive or live successfully. And so if you translate that to the, the heart, so myocardial viability is, is the ability of the myocardium to survive after revascularization, recovery function, and improve survival. So uh, coronary artery disease is, is a common cause of um, um, cardiomyopathy, as we know. And it's also a strong predictor of mortality because uh, studies have actually shown that in patients with LV systolic dysfunction, uh, the, those who have more coronary disease associated with the cardiomyopathy, they have worse events. So uh, ischemic cardi cardiomyopathy actually has a significant uh, adverse um, outcome impact on these patients. So what are the mechanisms of LV systolic dysfunction in, in these patients? So uh, it all starts with a stable plaque, which can acutely rupture and lead to an acute MI as we know it, uh, or it could actually just uh, cause unstable uh, angina and after re repetitive uh, episode of ischemia, it can actually lead to LV systolic dysfunction or the plaque can actually um, chronically occlude and decrease the myocardial uh, perfusion lead to adverse remodeling and cardiomyopathy eventually. So there are different mechanisms for ischemic cardiomyopathy in this, for the development of these patients. Um, and so there are different ways we can actually assess for myocardial viability uh, and nowadays. Um, and, and basically there's a continuum between viable and non-viable myocardium and there are different ways we can have, we have myocardial perfusion uh, imaging with a SPAC, PET, or even MRI. We can assess for myocardial contract contractile reserve with the butamine echo or even the butamine MRI. We can look at the cellular membrane uh, integrity with thallium, or we can look at cellular uh, metabolic activity with FDG PET. And also, we can directly assess the, the, the transmurality of a scar with MRI, or, but also with uh, myocardial perfusion combined with FDG. So, um, there are um, multiple uh, studies trying to look at the diagnostic accuracy of um, myocardial viability, and there are multiple tests. We have the Biomistry Seco, Thallium, those were the most common uh, modalities for evaluation of viability in the first, um, in the first years of nuclear cardiology, but in the last 10 to 15 years, uh, myocardial, perfu um, myocardial perfusion combined with FDG PET and, and MRI have become the most important modalities for the evaluation of um, viability. And, and basically when you assess myocardial viability, the sensitivity of the test implies the ability of the test to detect non-viable myocardium. So basically a myocardium that has a low, lower likelihood of functional recovery after revascularization. And the specificity is whenever you detect viability and, and, and the patients have a higher likelihood of function recovery post revascularization. And so according to those definitions, st studies have actually shown that the sensitivity, sensitivity of PET and MRI is the highest for the detection 
for the evaluation of myocardial vi viability, but the beauty industry cycle has the highest specificity. So if you see the wall getting better with, with the butamine, that actually implies that there's myocardium that is viable and it's, it's, it's augmenting function. So it makes sense, but also PET has a good uh, specificity. So overall, PET is a very good uh, uh, modality for the evaluation of um, um, uh, viability. It has both a good sensitivity and specificity. So FDG um, is actually FDA approved for this indication. It was FDA approved in 2000. So it's been in the market for 20 years now. So it's not uh, something new. And like I said, I, I think only the last 10 years we've been actually using more FDG PET uh, because before it was mostly by uh, Thallium and, and WNS echocardiography. And basically uh, FDG is a, a glucose analog that basically enters the cells um, and, 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 and it enters the cells via the glucose transporters and, and is phosphorylated and bas basically trapped, okay? And, and we know that in ischemia, uh, there's uh, flow-dependent oxygen and substrate delivery of, of glucose. And when a pa patient has ischemic myocardium, there's a, a metabolic switch and there's increased, in, increased glucose extraction and utilization in ischemic myocardium and therefore, if, you, if we see evidence of glucose accumulation in, 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 in segments that uh, we are concerned whether they're viable or not, that is indicative that there's definitely uh, viable cells there. And if we see significant glucose upregulation, then there's also a possibility that those cells might be also ischemic. So um, how do we put it all together? So everything starts with a small plaque, right? That starts uh, narrowing uh, the, 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 the coronary lumen. Uh, at this point, the stress myocardial blood flow uh, is probably preserved, okay? And the coronary flow reserve is also probably preserved. LV function is probably unaffected, but patient probably is already developing diastolic dysfunction at this point. As, as coronary atherosclerosis progresses, uh, patients can actually develop repetitive ischemia, okay? And this, this can actually lead to stunned myocardium, uh, and, 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 and we're gonna see a drop in the, in the, in the stress myocardial blood flow and flow reserve. Also, the, the systolic function can actually um, get worse. At this point, um, if we do a, a simple stress test, we're gonna see that the rest perfusion is probably normal, and, and we're gonna see evidence of reversibility in, 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 the, in the area of question. When, Coronary disease progresses to almost subtotal occlusion of, of the lumen. What happens is uh, initially there's no replacement fibrosis in these, in these patients, okay? But LV systolic dysfunction continues uh, to progress. Uh, at this point, if we do a stress test, the perfusion and rest could be abnormal because when, when you have a very tight lesion, the autoregulation of the resting myocardial blood flow is also affected. So the resting myocardial blood flow also drops us at this, uh, at this point, and this can actually lead to a, a resting perfusion abnormality that is not necessarily related to the development of a scar, but resting hypoperfusion, okay? However, if nothing is done, uh, the natural history is that these patients are gonna continue to develop uh, reparative ischemia, uh, and, and patients are going to start developing subendocardial uh, sub scar that is initially non-transmural. And at this point, um, if we do a viability assessment, we're going to see that the perfusion is going to be abnormal at rest. But this area, is, if it's ischemic, will actually have significant glucose upregulation, like in this case. In, in, in either event, uh, these my, this myocardial, my, myocardial segments are considered viable. And if you see glucose upregulation, is, this is actually the definition of hibernating or at-risk myocardium. Um, unfortunately, if, if um, there is uh, nothing, if, if the process uh, proceeds, uh, the natural history that these patients are going to develop uh, oftentimes uh, transmural scar, okay? And if we do um, FDG evaluation in this, in this particular patients, we're gonna see that uh, there, the, there's a, a, a large defect with reduced perfusion without metabolic activity. And this would be consistent with 
with non-viable myocardium because of transmural scar. So um, what are the imaging protocols that we have available for the evaluation of uh, myocardial viability with ipg -PET? So if you have a, a cyclotron or you have a generator, uh, you could actually use PET for myocardial perfusion followed by FDG. But if you don't have access to a, a cyclotron or a, a, a generator, you can, you can use myocardial perfusion with a SPEC and then FDG. So the typical protocol is that you, you, you should do both rest and stress perfusion um, with rubidium, given the, the short half-life, it, it only takes 20 minutes to do a rest and stress procedure, and then uh, you would do the, the FDG preparation and inject FDG and, 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 and get your images. Whereas if you do a SPAC, uh, depending on your protocol, um, uh, it can take up to three hours because of the longer half-life of technician uh, 99 uh, um, labeled protocols. So what is the preparation for these patients? They, they typically fast for six to 12 hours. This is part of the standardization uh, procedure. And then there are different ways you can actually maximize uh, the glucose utilization of the heart, okay? So basically what we wanna do is, is make sure that the heart uses as much glucose as possible uh, during this procedure. And so the, the most uh, common uh, method for that is, is the glucose load uh, followed by a, a insulin sliding scale. Uh, um, there's another, there are other methods like the hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp, which basically is a, is a method where you infuse insulin and glucose until you achieve euglycemia, but it's, it's quite uh, uh, time consuming and requires a lot of resources. And the other, 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 other methods that have actually been shown to, to work using like nicotinic acid derivatives like niacin that these are medications that actually uh, inhibit uh, fatty acid uh, utilization and increase glucose uh, uh, upregulation in the myocardium. And, and all of these procedures have actually uh, shown to work very well. So if you do a, a glucose load uh, followed by insulin line scale, you would inject FDG and then wait for 60 minutes and get your pictures. Whereas if you're doing the clamp, you will continue the insulin and the glucose administration inject FDG once the blood sugar is at, at a target and, and, and wait 60 minutes again and, and get your pictures. And if you're using uh, one of these uh, medications that inhibit free fatty acids, you would give the medicine, wait, inject the retracer, and again, wait for 60 minutes. So uh, as mentioned, the oral glucose low followed by insulin sliding scale is the most common uh, protocol because uh, it's less time consuming and and it's, it's relatively um, easier to uh, carry out. And so basically what you do is uh, patients will check in, we would check the blood sugar level and depending on, on the blood sugar level, they would get oral glucose load that would actually stimulate the endogenous release of insulin. We would wait 45 to 60 minutes and we would check the blood sugar. If the blood sugar at this point is less than 140, we would inject FDG, but the vast majority of the patients have some degree of insulin uh, resistance and and they will require insulin in several doses uh, until the blood sugar is at target. So why is it important to give insulin? So this is a, a patient that actually was um, uh, imaged just after oral glucose load. Some hospitals don't, don't follow insulin sliding scale uh, routinely and, and only do it on certain cases, but this is what can happen if you only uh, uh, treat a patient with an oral glucose load. So here, this patient, had no uptake in the myocardium whatsoever. So he had actually had to come back and then he was treated with, with, with uh, again, the order glucose load followed by insulin and then we see myocardial activity. So it's very important to actually give in insulin. So um, once we actually get our images, then the next question is, what is um, the imaging findings between the perfusion and the metabolism? And there are different patterns and they have different um, uh, interpretation and, and clinical significance. So uh, if you see a match anormality in the setting of uh, a fixed defect, uh, or not a fixed defect, but a resting perfusion anormality with, with lack of metabolic activity, this is consistent with uh, non-viable myocardium and, and the likelihood of functional function, function recovery post revascularization is minimal in, 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 in this setting. On the other hand, if you have a PET mismatch with actual, with glucose upregulation, this is actually what you wanna see. 
you want to see a, a fixed, uh, you, you want to see a defect with glucose upregulation, okay? So that's, that implies that there's not only viable myocardium, but actually ischemic myocardium, okay? So this is the definition of hibernating myocardium. And the, and the, and the likelihood of functional, functional recovery is higher in, in this setting. This is the highest uh, um, likelihood for functional recovery. In other cases, you can have a perfusion defect, okay, here, but there's only some activity there's uptake. This is still considered a mismatch because there's, there's, there's preserved metabolic activity, but the uptake is not as high as in this case, as you can see here. So what that means is that this is likely viable myocardium, but it's not ischemic. So it's not, it's not jeopardized myocardium and the likelihood of functional recovery post revascularization is less clear. There are other situations that are less common where you can actually have relatively preserved perfusion, but when you actually look at the metabolic activity, this reduced uptake, okay? And so this is called the reverse mismatch. And these situations are sometimes seen in, in, in patients with post ischemic stun myocardium. So after an acute MI, the myocardium may have some degree of stunning after reperfusion. So this is still viable because the perfusion is okay but it has reduced metabolic activity for, for, for days or weeks. So most likely if you re-image this patient after several weeks, uh, you should see uh, FDG activity. We also see sometimes this pattern in patients with lead bundle branch block. And, and interestingly, uh, after CRT um, um, implantation, the FDG activity seems to improve after the desynchronous improve. Paco, um, there, was, um, there were some questions in the chat uh, that I think it's a good time for. One yeah. was, have any of the different protocols uh, been compared with optimal, in terms of optimal myocardial FDG uptake? Yes, and um, most studies have shown that the um, hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp is the, the, the method that achieves the highest uh, myocardial glucose uptake, uh, but is also the most time consuming. And probably the differences are not significant, but some sites, for example, uh, they will use this, this, this type of uh, preparation in patients who are insulin uh, dependent uh, diabetics. Uh, uh, or sometimes what may happen is you, you, you do the glucose load with, with, with insulin supplement and, you, and, and the myocardium doesn't work. The, the uptake is not very good. In these cases, you may consider doing this hyperinsulinemic uh, euglycemic clamp. Okay, and any other question? question? that came up was, um, how can you tell if the prep was actually done correctly? I don't know if you're gonna talk about that more. Um, well, so th that's actually a good question and that's why it's, it's so important to actually have the perfusion for, for, for correlation, okay? Like in this case, uh, in the, Bet reverse mismatch that there's lack of uptake here, um, and 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 you see that the perfusion is preserved, so you know that is viable. Okay, so that's the good news. So the perfusion here is helping you uh, uh, that there's there's viability because there's no perfusion abnormality per se. Uh, but what is actually causing the the hypometabolic state in this location will also depend on the history because if we know that the patient had a a recent uh, MI in the LAD that was revascularized, then probably that explains explains it. Also, if the patient has a lead bundle branch block and we see reduced uptake in the septum, that could also explain it. Um, and typically, when patients don't take up uh, look, when patients have insulin resistance, the, 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 there's there's reduced uptake in most of the myocardium. Any other question? There were a couple of questions about the third case on the last slide. Um, that what's the explanation for there being FDG uptake throughout the whole myocardium? Right. So this 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 patient most likely had a a, a non-transmural infarct here in the inferolateral wall, and this is non-transmural, meaning that the remaining myocardium is viable and is accumulating FDG. Everything else is normal. Okay, so this, pro this patient probably had a small non-transmural infarct and uh, it was probably revascularized 
and it's no longer ischemic. That's probably uh, what's going on, but it's viable. All right, so, um, so there are several imaging parameters that we're gonna be looking at uh, as we go um, along with, this, um, uh, the, with the cases. So we're gonna be looking at myocardial perfusion and, and, and metabolic imaging to assess infarct size because it's very important. Uh, we're gonna also look at the extent of viable and hibernated myocardium. We're gonna also look at the extent of jeopardized myocardium when we're doing the stress testing. And we're also gonna be looking at the LV volumes because it's very important. You may, you may have situations where everything looks great but the heart is so big, so dilated that it's probably too late for, 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 for the patient to recover function. Okay, so we're gonna do the first case. Uh, this is a 65 year old female with dyspnea, chest pain, and, and basically uh, has a dilated heart with an EF of 25, 30%. There's global hypokinesis with some regional variation and they refer the patient for a stress test. So the first um, is that the perfusion is, is really unremarkable at rest. We don't see any perfusion abnormalities. So we proceed with stress testing and the stress testing shows that the perfusion is completely normal. So so is it, is it possible that this patient has coronary disease? It's very unlikely. So we look at the flow as well, and the coronary flow is completely normal during the stress. The flow reserve is mildly reduced, but probably because the resting myocardial blood flow is somewhat higher than normal. But when we look at the, 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 the CT uh, fortunation correction, there was no calcium. So this is likely a, a, a case of a, a, a non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy. And, 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 and with a stress test alone is enough information to basically rule out that this patient has uh, an ischemic process, all right? So how about uh, the next case? Uh, this is a 39-year-old male with exceptional dyspnea. This patient has a, a history of um, uh, familiar hyperlipidemia, had cabbage, uh, lima to LAD, and a uh, venous graft to a ramus, and a radial graft to a D1, two years prior to this evaluation, and the EF was 46%. So we started with the rest perfusion. Uh, and what you can see is there's a, uh, there's a mild defect in the anterolateral wall, you see that here, but it's really tiny. So it's a really tiny defect, so a very small amount of scar. So, so if you just look at this, you know that this, this is all viable. So there's no really significant myocardium um, um, that, 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 uh, that has uh, fibrosis or um, at least replacement fibrosis. But then at this point, what you need to do is do the stress test because FPG is no longer indicated. And what you see is that this, this patient has a, a large amount of ischemic myocardium. So this patient has, has a lot of myocardium at risk. So 30% or more of the myocardium is ischemic. And with evidence of TIV, so this is consistent with multivessel coronary disease. So basically the studies show that uh, there's really a small amount of scar at baseline, but a large amount of uh, jeopardized or ischemic myocardium. FPG is not indicated when the rest perfusion is, is normal, okay? So that's why it's so important to always do rest stress MPI before consider, considering viability assessment. The next case is a 68-year-old uh, woman with uh, NYHA class three, uh, had cabbage times two, uh, two vessel cabbage, I'm sorry, lima to LAV and, uh, and, uh, and a venous graft to M1 and also has risk factors, uh, EF 35%. And basically what we see here, we start with the rest stress test, is that there's a, a defect at rest in the inferolateral wall that is um, medium size and, and moderately reduced. So it's, it's moderate in severity, but on the stress images, we see that the, the defect becomes significantly larger, okay? So suggestive that there's, there's evidence of likely per infarct ischemia in the anterolateral wall, but also there's, there's hypoperfusion on, 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 of the anterolateral wall on the stress images. So that implies that there's also ischemia in, in that second territory, not just the anterolateral wall, but also the anterolateral wall. So we did FPG for further evaluation of this anterolateral wall. And what you see is that there's glucose upregulation of this segment. But there's also upregulation of the anterolateral wall. There's suppression of the rest of the myocardium because most of the glucose accumulation is in this, in this segments. Whenever you see this pattern, this is highly suggestive that this, my, this myocardium is ischemic at rest. And this is most likely what's happening, okay? FTG is actually a not, not too bad radio tracer for the evaluation of ischemia as well. There have been studies showing that FTG can be used for evaluation of ischemia. Uh, and even resting ischemia, and as in this case. 
So here is everything together. You have the stress images, the rest images, and the FDG. So uh, you, what you can see is that the stress images not match very nicely the, the stress uh, perfusion abnormality. So basically, in summary, we have a, a medium-sized area of a scar in the interlateral wall with very infarct ischemia and glucose upregulation. So this is consistent with hibernating myocardium. There's also a, a medium-sized area of ischemia in the anterolateral wall with glucose upregulation consistent with ischemia. And so this is, this is suggested that this patient has at least two vascular uh, territories at risk. So the patient was cath, and in, indeed the patient had uh, a, a very tight uh, a couple of lesions in the circumflex, but also in the diagonal, and the patient was intervened. Patient had some improvement in dyspnea. Uh, ejection fraction actually improved five points, but the patient actually continued with significant hypokinesis of the inferior wall two months after the PCI. And then you're wondering, so how come? I mean, if the patient had uh, evidence of viable myocardium, why is it that after two months you still see hypokinesis? Well, it turns out that if you have, st studies have shown that if, if you have abnormal perfusion, even with preserved metabolism, uh, it may take several, uh, several months up to a year for, Im for, for improvement of the function. And even after 12 months, the function recovery is not the same as if you don't have uh, perfusion abnormalities. So basically, anytime you have subendocardial scar, the, the function recovery is never complete. Uh, next case is a, a 54 year old male with uh, neon onset dyspnea. And basically this patient has a horrible coronary disease. The left main is, is okay, but then the, the proximal LAD is occluded as well as this, the circumflex has subtotal occlusion. The RCA uh, has um, uh, a, a distal uh, lesion. So three, severe three vessel coronary disease. And this patient initially underwent cardiac MRI for, for viability assessment. And these are the apical, mid, and basal images. And what we're looking at is legato neon enhancement. And what you see is that the enhancement is, is not transmural. So it's really not involving the full thickness of the, of the, of the LAD distribution. Um, and, but there was some concern in some views that it looks, it looks more, 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 more transmural than in other views. So the patient was referred for, for PET for evaluation of viability. Uh, and here you have the rest images. The patient was not stressed at this point. And you see here that there's um, a, 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 a perfusion abnormality in the anterior wall, but there's also a perfusion abnormality in the lateral wall with, with uh, glucose upregulation. So the anterior wall has a nice uptick, and you see that here. You see the defect, this, the rest perfusion with glucose upregulation here. And also you see the glucose upregulation in the lateral wall. So there's a really nice uh, meta metabolic uh, perfusion mismatch in the anterior wall, uh, apex, and lateral wall. So, so um, consistent with uh, um, viral myocardium, but at the same time, this patient has a, a large amount of, of, of scar. You know, it's not transmural, but has a lot of scar in the LAD and, and circumflex distribution. The good news is that the proximal LAD and the RCA distribution should show normal perfusion without evidence of significant scar. And so some studies, observational, however, have shown that patients uh, with PET mismatch, um, they do much better if they undergo cabbage uh, versus medical treatment, okay? And so this patient underwent uh, uh, four vessel bypass graft surgery, uh, but didn't do well. Just uh, shortly after surgery, he became unstable and went into pump failure and required an LVAD. And, and, and he was eventually transplanted a year later. So what, what happened here? So if, you know, if, if we found that this patient had significant viability, how come that he didn't do well? Well, it turns out that um, this patient had a huge heart, actually. So his end, end diastolic and sister were, were huge. So he had severe advanced uh, adverse remodeling. And studies have actually shown that if your, your pre-op LV and systolic volume is less than, uh, is greater than 100 ml uh, square meter. Uh, patients do, don't do well, even if they, in the presence of viable myocardium. And a couple of studies have shown that, that uh, the, the bigger your heart, the worse your outcomes, independent on whether you have viability assessment or not. Same thing with a scar. So if you have a lot of a scar after cabbage, the function recovery is actually minimal. 
And this patient had a significant amount of scar, more than 30% of his myocardium had evidence of a scar. It was not transmittable, but it was, it was non-transmittable, but it was significant. So, so the teaching point here is that the likelihood of LV function recovery actually decreases with increasing LV chamber size and extent of LV scar, despite of the presence of a PET uh, uh, mismatch. So that's actually important to know. Um, we only have two more cases. Um, the next case is uh, a 51-year-old male with uh, recurrent VT, um, past medical history, um, PCI in the LAV and MI seven years prior, and EF was really low with anterior akinesia. And these are the images. The patient had a stress, a stress test, show a fixed defect here. You can see that the entire epical cap, about 30, 40% of the myocardium has a scar, it's fixed, it's very dense. In a situation like this, when, 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 when the defect is so severe, so dense, it's very unlikely that this represents viable myocardium. In, the, in these situations where you have thin in this kinesia, so, so really uh, FDG adds very little, and, but we did it, and FDG basically just confirmed that that dense scar area was, was non-viable. We didn't have any, any, any um, FDG activity, so this is consistent now with, with a transmural scar. And the patient was not revascularized as a result, and he had a, a catheter-based PT ablation, continued with uh, heart failure progression, and was related and eventually transplanted. And the last case I have is a, is a 85-year-old male with neo-onset dyspnea. Um, he also has multiple myeloma, and he was on treatment. That's, that's, that's relevant because of what happens later. Um, and basically, he developed uh, shortness of breath of lot of effort. The EF was mildly reduced with some hypokinesis of the anterior septum. And basically, the patient had a, this is a SPECT, actually, had a, a stress and rest SPECT study. So uh, these are different images. This is the first SPECT study that I show you. And it, it showed that there was a, a, a mostly fixed defect in the end septum with some reversibility, but it was mostly fixed, but also there was some reversibility in the, in the, in the lateral wall. As you can see here, the lateral wall has some reversibility, but the perfusion at, at rest was abnormal in the lateral wall. So you wonder whether there, this lateral wall has some degree of infarction or not already. Um, also the inferior wall uh, um, look a little bit uh, reduced counts, but it looked better on the stress images. So most likely this is just the pharmatic attenuation. But so overall, basically we see a, a mostly fixed defect in the anterior septum and apex and a, in a partially reversible defect in the lateral wall, consistent with multivessel coronary disease. Um, the patient was actually cath and he had left main disease. So he had disease in, in, in the left main Ostea and the circumflex, proximal LAD, but there was also disease in the, in the, in the RCA, osteal RCA. Um, and the patient had multiple myeloma, and so he was not really a great surgical candidate. So, um, so the, he, he, he was actually a candidate at this point for uh, percutaneous revascularization. And the question here is whether we need to uh, pursue viability assessment or whether we have enough information. Well, Bottom line is, it's really hard to make a case to do viability assessment when the question is left main. And, and in this case, the patient was not even considered for bypass surgery, it was going to be percutaneous. So, so I, I think in, this, in, this, in a situation like this, you can skip the viability assessment and just go for, for what, what you have. And, and basically, the patient was intervened uh, under an impella support, and actually, the, the result were, were quite nice. Um, and, and interestingly, the patient uh, did well for some time, but then he started developing a new uh, onset symptoms and he came back for a repeated stress test. And, and basically what I wanna show you is, look at the lateral wall, how much uh, basically normalized. So that perfusion abnormality that we saw, and here I have side by side for comparison, that, that lateral wall defect that we initially saw, it was all resting ischemia. There was no scar because the perfusion normalized. So it's, so that was mostly resting ischemia causing a, a perfusion anomaly at rest. And, 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 and the cavity chamber, the, the chamber size also got better, got smaller, EF got better. So a really nice, remarkable uh, result after this re revascularization. Okay. Paco, All right. Yes. For the SPECT studies, I'm getting some questions in the chat about the role of nitrates 
when you're doing those viability protocols, and I thought you could comment on their role and any regional or lab-specific variability we might see with that protocol. Uh, I think using nitrous uh, for spec makes sense. Uh, I, there's data showing that improves the, the accuracy of the test. Uh, but uh, we don't use nitrates because we don't use much spec for viability. We use FBG PET, and, and in those situations, we don't, there's not really much of, of a gain um, when we use those um, uh, medications. Uh, all right, so this is all I have for viability. Uh, uh, there, more question? Excuse me, Sharmila here, I have a question. Yes. Could you comment about the role of stress testing when patients are referred for viability evaluation and your rest perfusion looks normal? Yes, absolutely. So it, it basically that was one of the cases that uh, I showed earlier that we should be doing a stress testing routine on everyone for viability assessment because what we find is that a, a, a I don't know, like 10%, 20% of, of the cases, they have normal perfusion at rest and they have inducible ischemia, okay? So like, like we said, it's very important to investigate for, for, for jeopardized myocardium and myocardium at risk and you, you're not gonna be able to assess that without a stress testing. So, and that's also part of the viability assessment because at the end of the day, what we wanna know is what patients are more likely to benefit from coronary revascularization. Paco, there was also a question of whether um, viability testing is necessary if an echo shows hypokinesis uh, rather than akinesis? Oh, yes. Yeah, so the one more, yes. So, you know, there's a lot of subjectivity, uh, but I think it's very important to actually look at your echo as well, because if, you, if your, your echo shows thinning of the wall is dyskinetic, I don't think there's a, much of a question that that's pro unlikely to be viable myocardium, especially if it's a chronic process. So it's very important to, to look everything together. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at the echo and the wall thickness is preserved, most likely the, 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 the wall is, the, the, most likely the myocardium is viable. Uh, so I think it's very important to actually look at the wall. The wall thickness and, and, the, and, and, and the contractility on echo. Two other diagnostic questions that are coming in. Can you comment on how active sarcoid might behave on some of these FDG studies? This is question one. And then, yeah, why don't you do that one first? Sarcoidosis. Well, so for sarcoidosis, um, we're not gonna be able to assess sarcoidosis with this protocol, right? Because here we're doing the opposite. Uh, for sarcoidosis, we want the heart to stop using glucose because with FVG, we're assessing inflammation, okay? And so basically those patients are put on, on this uh, ketogenic diet, which is basically uh, carbohydrate restricted, high fat, high protein. And, and after 24 hours, most hearts will stop using uh, glucose. And so if you see uptake in the heart, uh, it's most likely related to inflammation. Although you could also have FVG uptake related to ischemia. In, in sarcoidosis, uh, and it, that's certainly a possibility. But if you have a patient with sarcoidosis and you put them on this protocol, you're not gonna be able to assess inflammation, inflammation because yes. all of the heart is gonna light up with, with FDG activity. I just wanted to make sure that, that point was clear. Thanks, Paco. And then the second one is when you're using PET studies, can you comment on if myocardial flow reserve or, or CFR has been correlated at all with viability um, I think we don't really look much at coronary flow reserve when we see when there's a lot of a scar at baseline. Um, uh, in this, I think coronary flow reserve is, is quite helpful when there's not much a scar at baseline uh, because it's, it's more indicative of ischemia. Uh, when you have a scar, the, the evaluation of coronary, coronary flow reserve is actually affected because the resting myocardial blood flow is also significantly lower because you have less my, viable myocardium and sometimes you can have a lot of a scar and the flow reserve is like two. You're like, what's going on? So I think, it, so the flow reserve can be actually tricky to assess in, in, in the setting of a scar. Okay, so I think, and I think it's a cleaner assessment when the rest, when the rest myocardial perfusion is relatively preserved. Okay. Before we go on, anybody with any other questions? Okay, so two good questions here. One is, 
uh, I'm going to reinterpret slightly. Is there a role to repeat FDG after revascularization clinically? Question no, one. not really. And then not question. really because there's, a, there's a, I mean, what, what would be the point, to be honest? More than research would be the only, there's not really a, 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 a clinical situation where you would repeat um, viability. And then the second, which is a little bit of an allusion to some cases we're going to be talking about later, is there any concern for FDG viability accuracy in the setting of left bundle branch block? Uh, you know, that's actually a good question. And uh, as far as I know, there are no good studies looking at <laughs> viability assessment in patients with left bundle branch block, because as mentioned, left bundle can actually uh, reviews glucose upregulation in the septum. So it's actually a tricky uh, situation. Uh, so uh, it's, it's unclear to me how much a lead bundle can affect the interpretation of a viability assessment, especially if it's in the LAD distribution, right? Because if the viability assessment is in the circumflex or the RCA, it's probably not a problem. But if, if it happens to be a proximal LAD case, then it could be a problem. Paco, another uh, question which I think is on a lot of people's minds is how to decide between cardiac MRI and FTG PET for the assessment okay. of viability. Maybe you uh, could comment on that a little. Right. Uh, it, it's really dependent on institutional experience and preference. So if, you, if you're unbiased, if you're really unbiased and look at the data, um, the, the diagnostic accuracy of PET and cardiac MRI is considered to be uh, equivalent, okay? So very similar overall diagnostic accuracy. They, they have pros and cons. Um, obviously with MRI, there's no preparation. So that's actually a good thing. Uh, but oftentimes these patients have uh, renal dysfunction and, and, um, and, and they may have a device. And if you have a device, then the evaluation of uh, LG is affected. So in eligible patients, say patients who have decent GFR, I think uh, it's starting with MRI is totally appropriate. And again, it depends on, on the institution's uh, experience and, and expertise, basically. Uh, there have been a couple of questions about um, patients with hibernating myocardium. Uh, in which situations or how would you uh, evaluate a response after revascularizing somebody who had previously had hibernating myocardium? Is that necessary? And if so, how would you do it? Um, in somebody who has evidence of hibernating myocardium and are being worked out for revascularization already underwent revascularization. I think the, the question is if, if you have a study that shows hibernating myocardium for a patient, subsequently that patient gets revascularized. Um, is there anything to evaluate the response either with echocardiography, echocardiography at, at that point uh, and symptoms, basically you have to see how the, the heart failure symptoms or angina improve. And also if there's improvement in the ejection fraction and, 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 and or regional wall motion anormalities on echocardiography. I don't think there's any point in repeating uh, unless there's a question of under the situation that may, may happen is if you didn't revascularize all the, 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 the uh, lesions and you're wondering whether you need to go back in, then at this point, maybe it's a situation that you may have to do with either just a stress test or with viability assessment, depending on the, on, on the stress test findings. Another interesting question that came up, is there anything any pattern that you might see on an oncologic PET scan that might predict cardiac ischemia? That's an excellent question. And unfortunately, there's, um, first of all, there are no studies that have actually looked at that, um, that particular question. And, and the problem is that uh, these oncology studies are done after uh, overnight fasting. And, and after overnight fasting, you can have very funny incomplete suppression of FDG. You can have FDG uptake in certain, in certain ways. So it would be impossible to actually assess the, the significance of FDG activity after, uh, after, um, after um, an oncologic study, unless it's, it's in a location that would be very unusual for, for, for incomplete suppression. Like for example, I think if you see a, a FDG uptake that is very focal and limited to the anterior septum, then you would have to wonder whether that's related to something else. 
but for the most part, you will see so many different patterns of optic that is that is is, is, is just physiologic. Okay. Paco, could you for the group review a little bit how CMR detects scar and predicts hibernating myocardium, just so that we've we've heard that uh, workflow. Yes. And basically, this slide um, is basically a nice way to actually try to put it all together. So, so when you have a scar, a scar actually causes um, 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 involvement of the subendocardium, okay? From coronary disease, when the scar is related to coronary disease, you, 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 the scar is, is, is in the, it starts in the subendocardium, it moves towards the towards the subepicardium, okay? So, and then the MRI literature, if the scar uh, wall thickness is less than 50%, so basically if you have wall, a scar occupying less than 50% of the wall thickness uh, of, of any particular segment, that is considered a non-transmural scar, okay? And if you have non-transmural scar, that means that you have 50% myocardium that is, is, is viable. And those, those patients have some degree uh, uh, or, or some likelihood of functional recovery after revascularization. However, if you have uh, a scar that is occupying more than 50% of the wall thickness, 50, 75, 100%, it's unlikely that there's gonna be functional recovery because there's no really residual viable myocardium, okay? And, and, and that's basically how, how you actually uh, use MRI for the evaluation of viable myocardium. But, you, but again, you also have the ejection fraction, the LV size, so similar, similar to what we uh, went over today. Paco, one uh, thing that on this slide, I think maybe could use some, some people are asking for clarification. Um, in the third set of images over with the non-transmural fibrosis, uh, there's a question of why the areas of normal myocardium appear not to have any FDG uptake. Um, yes, 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 exactly. So, so when you are going to see this pattern only when you have ischemia. Okay, when you have ischemia, you have glucose upregulation. So this myocardium is taking up glucose. It's just that the normalization of the images is such that it looks that there's only uptake in these segments, but in reality, there's uptake also in, in, in the entire wall. It's just that the uptake is so much higher in these segments that it looks like it's, there's, it's, there's only uptake in, 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 in this wall. But this is just glucose upregulation. And, and, and due to the normalization of the images, it looks like there's no uptake, but indeed there's uptake. And that's normal. The, this myocardium is non-ischemic and it's normal. And here it shows you that there's so much activity because there's ischemia here most likely, okay? I think that's the, that's the end of the questions we have right now. Excellent. All right, so uh, let's move on to our cases, Michael. Um, um, so, uh, Michael, so do the first four cases, and then we stop, and we do, then, then we move to the next. I'm Michael Ayers. I'm general cardiology with a uh, focus on advanced imaging. I'll be starting at the University of Virginia next year, reading echo and nuclear. I also did CT, um, and it's really nice for Paco to invite me to help present some cases here. So we're gonna do something slightly different for these next cases than we did for the first cases. And for those of you who have been on these in the past, it's gonna be more akin to what we were doing. We're gonna have fellows read. Um, rather than working through the full 4D uh, M application for each of these, we have slides. And so we're not gonna be able to troubleshoot everything, but I, I should be able to get through the majority of the material. Uh, do you wanna bring up the first slide, Paco? Okay, so I had a volunteer for the first one a little bit ago. Um, can you unmute yourself? Yes. How do I say your first name? Batter, just like more bat. Oh, batter, just like more bat. All right, where are you coming from, batter? Um, talking from San Antonio, UT San Antonio. Awesome, welcome. Thank you for taking the first case. So, um, Paco, go back to the first slide for us. This is a 61-year-old woman that's got a new diagnosis of rectal cancer, and in the last six to 12 months, 
Um, she's got a new diagnosis of cardiomyopathy, globally reduced EF of 15%, and beyond that, she's got a longstanding history of severe MR and TR. She's unable to do much at home due to fatigue, and so they elect to get a perioperative risk stratification with a SPECT, Regadenison SPECT. So you want to walk us through this first slide? Sure. Um, when I look at the images, um, in the beginning, usually the first thing I look at just to rule out any uh, high-risk findings or studies, I can't see much the right ventricle, which is a good sign. Um, some sort of visual TID might be seen in the short axis. Uh, and the others, I guess I just heard dilated cardiomyopathy. The short axis start from the top, um, the stress images compared to the rest images. I can see some septal. Um, uh, I can see the septum not, not uptaking the uh, nuclear tracer uh, much, but no significant difference to the rest images. And uh, then when I go to the uh, um, match LA, um, the lateral view also, the lateral wall doesn't uh, seems to be shining much, but again, no significant um, ischemia that I can really call. Uh, the anterior uh, wall compared to the uh, inferior wall seems like both of them are have very low um, uptake. I'm not sure if this is, I don't, I don't think this is reversible ischemia. It seems like either fixed or like some sort of scarring. Great. So we started off with this Regadenison stretch non-AC image, and I love what you did. First, you commented on the lack of uptake in the RV or lungs, but uh, you did note one possible high-risk finding, which is the visual PID you're seeing on the short axis images. Then you worked your way through the walls, and you commented on a fixed defect from the mid to apical anterior and septal walls, as well as the inferior walls. So anytime we have our uh, SPECT camera, we want to make sure that we look also at our attenuation corrected images. And so you want to walk us through these? Sure. It seems like there's some um, extra cardiac uptake. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing that's um, all gut. And I guess uh, with increased shining or increased uh, uptake from the um, uh, some subdiaphragmatic, maybe uh, the best uh, term for it, it seems like it's increasing the uptake and somehow blunting the uh, um, the uh, inferior wall. Uh, seems like now in stress, the images are better than compared to rest. Okay. And so how does this change or not change your read? So you called two defects to begin with, this anterior, anteroceptal, infraceptal, and now, uh, and then the second defect being the inferior wall, so two vessel disease. Do you still think there's inferior wall or are you gonna give that a pass? I'm gonna give that a pass. Okay, great. So we've got possibly single vessel disease with a fixed defect in the anterior and septal walls. And so uh, going next, we're going to see if our gated images agree with what you said. Uh, they're, not, they're not running. If they were running, what you would see here is a lack of count augmentation, particularly in the septal and anterior walls. And whenever we see this, we associate that with a lack of thickening. And so we think that the anterior and septal defect is possibly real. Um, and then as you're scrolling through all of your different windows before you click off to prelim your report, uh, you happen to slow down on this desynchrony slide that we oftentimes will breeze through. And are you familiar with these, Batter? Not really. So I'm going to kind of walk you through the slide then, OK? Mm -hmm. So looking at the graphs that Paco's hovering over, the x-axis on the far left graph there, that has to do with where you are in the R to R interval. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, the beginning zero on the far left will be at the beginning of electrical systole, but mechanical systole lags behind that and doesn't start till about 35. And so what you see then on the y-axis is how many counts are being generated at those different moments during the R to R interval. For normal hearts, you're going to see the vast majority of the counts being generated between 35 and 50. Everything in that region is then going to be given a color. And each segment of the myocardium, using the plots that we see on the far right, are going to be given a color that describes where they were on the R to R interval. 
normal hearts again everything's between 35 and 55 in that kind of brown maroon color and so we would expect the heart to be basically one brown color occasionally you'll see a tail going into the 25 to 35 region which is light green and occasionally a tail in the 55 to 65 region which is sort of that salmon color on my screen but what do you notice now that you've kind of been walked through that histogram chart on the left about the overall spread of the counts? Are they all happening during what you would have anticipated mechanical systole to be? Not, not, not seems to be. Yeah, and you see that big clump of uh, kind yeah. of tannish counts happening all the way at 75 to 80? Yeah. So when you see, okay, so it says there's a whole bunch of counts being generated at that time. And then going over to our plot here, we can see which part of the myocardium is generating those plot, plots. And what do you notice? Yeah, there's, uh, I'm not sure what's the best way to describe it, but like non homogeneous or non um, organized lesion that's kind of more like an artifact. Um, yeah, I'm you're, not the best way to describe it. Yeah, you're, you're dancing around perfect language for that. So what you're seeing is the area that's generating these left, these late counts are all in the septum. Can you think of a condition where I might have delayed generation of septal counts that causes some dysynchrony of the septum? I left bundle branch block or paste uh, rhythm. Beautiful. Or... You, got, you got both of the big things in the differential, which is uh, pacing and left bundle. And so, do you want to walk us through this EKG? Sure, it seems like it's uh, A-sense V-paste. Uh... Yeah, so A-sense V-paste. And what you're seeing is that it's a left bundeloid morphology through the precordium. Um, so this is probably right bundle pacing with it all the way out in the apex of the heart. Because I'm saying in the apex because you can see your lateral leads are not positive. So whatever <laughs> force is being generated is actually going slightly left to right, even though it's a right, uh, uh, an RV pacing. So um, you saw septal dyssynchrony, and now you've got this EKG that shows pacing. So yeah, most likely that septal uh, defect is because of the uh, artifact of the pacing and not appropriate gating through the EKG. Great, so two possibilities here. One, your initial read was correct. There was a large mid-LED infarct that now has thinning and a fixed defect from mid to apex. Or two, somehow this persistent RV pacing is generating dyssynchrony in a way that's subtracting counts from the septum and anterior wall, creating a, a pseudo-infarct. So that's your differential at this point. Let's go to the next slide. So the first shot on the far left is an LAO cranial where we see a small non-dominant RCA. Mm -hmm. And then what do you think about the LAD in the RAO cranial? It's a no, little- I, I can see right that's now. been already read on the, on the slides. Since the, there's also <laughs> a lady disease of 70%. Like a good cardiologist, <laughs> all the information is available to you. <laughs> so what you see there is actually a very, large caliber LAD that's patent. Um, and it's so large, in fact, you're getting a little bit of a streaming artifact in the mid LAD. And then on your last shot, the only place that you've got a significant lesion. That's a large dominant circle. Still the flow is not significantly limited. The lesion seems to be higher grade, but the, the flow is like TMA3. It doesn't seem like the flow limiting. So at this point, do you have a calf that correlates with your nuclear images? It's really hard to say because the nuclear imaging has multiple artifacts. So to uh, correlate that nuclear image or the nuclear defect to the actual um, um, angiogram and call it significant, I'm not sure. I would still, you know, if I'm in the cath lab, I would have IFR or FFR just to support more. Yeah. But, uh, and you're talking about that, that inferior lesion at the distal cirque before the PDA takeoff. What about the anterior fixed defect you saw on new? No, no, that doesn't correlate. Like yeah. the lady is pretty patent and maybe small vessel disease, that's we cannot rule out. So um, the point of this case was to discuss 
imaging, nuclear imaging for left bundle branch block. There are some studies from the late 80s, early 90s that show that left bundle branch blocks, particularly with exercise, can create a pseudo infarct pattern uh, or pseudo ischemia pattern in the septum and anterior wall. And for that reason, we switched to predominantly adenosine analogs pharmacologic stress. Uh, however, adenosine slowly been replaced by the newer age analog regadenosine, which does cause a little bit more of an increase in heart rate. Uh, but this group, Meredith et al. from the Cleveland Clinic, um, well, is everyone okay where I am right now? So you should, in general, you should do exercise over farm, or you should do a farm over exercise. So that's point one. Point two is it's been reported that SPECT is usually able to accurately detect coronary artery disease with a left bundle. But recently the question's been raised whether even SPECT is yeah. prone to pseudo infarcts. And so what this group at Cleveland Clinic showed was when they went back and looked at their patients with left bundles, a bunch of them had pseudo ischemia and pseudo infarcts on the SPECT studies that disappeared on the PET, meaning we had a cath that showed no obstructive coronary artery disease. We had a SPECT that had made us concerned about the septum and anterior wall, but when you had both a SPECT and a PET, you saw that the PET was able to more accurately diagnose the lack of coronary artery disease. Does this make sense to everybody? Paco, anything you want to add there? Uh, yes. So, so basically, um, the teaching has always been that patients with lead bundle branch blocks should not uh, exercise uh, because of the this known fact that you can actually induce a septal defect after uh, exercise stress testing. But what we've been seeing more recently is that, the, unfortunately, this septal hypoperfusion uh, occurs even at rest or independent of the, of the stressor. If you use uh, regadenosone, dipyridamol, we've, we've seen it with all of these different vasodilators. And uh, like in this case, we saw it even at rest. So it's very interesting that we're actually seeing this phenomenon uh, in, in a lot of cases, and in, we're actually looking at our own data, and, and, and this septal hypoperfusion can occur in up to 50% of patients with SPECT with angiographic uh, negative uh, LED disease, okay? So, so very common artifact in, in, in patients with lead bundle branch lock. But the interesting thing, finding from this publication is that this phenomenon is less, less uh, um, common with PET technology, but we still need to learn more if, if, if PET is actually um, uh, free of these artifacts. All right, so that was, that was good. Um, Paco, one quick question that came up. Is it known why PET may be less susceptible to this artifact than SPECT? There's that's sort of, a, that, go ahead. There's two uh, hypotheses hypotheses about why this might be. The first hypothesis is that somehow septal dyssynchrony decreases the amount of blood flow going to the septum. And so the reported defect is accurately reflecting a decrease in blood flow. The second hypothesis is that because the septum is getting pulled into the cavity during systole prior to it thickening, that those counts are getting spent over a larger area. And so you essentially get a partial volume averaging effect where the same amount of counts are generated, but because it's over a wider area, it appears less bright. Nobody really knows why. Michael is absolutely right. Uh, so what we know, I mean, what we can say is that PET has better um, a special um, um, resolution special resolution than SPECT. That's one potential hypothesis. Um, and and uh, so the radioisotopes are different. The, te the, the technique is different. And it's true. It seems like uh, there, there may be some component of reduced coronary blood flow to the septum in left bundle branch block. So this is actually an area of research. So we still don't know. All right, so let's uh, move on. Uh, so basically this is the summary for, for the cath correlation. Uh, this is, you can call it artifact or, I mean, it's unclear whether this perfusion, if, if, the, if, the, if, the, if, the, if the reduced counts are from an artifact or from hypoperfusion. So we don't know right now. 
Um, and what we know is that maybe PET is a better choice in, in patients with lead bundle punch block. This next one is a little bit more of a straightforward case. Uh, do I have any volunteers while I'm reading the stem? So this 57-year-old uh, with a history of CAD, multiple interventions in the past, uh, metabolic syndrome, develops classical angina, uh, eventually getting angina at rest. I think Rana was our first volunteer, if, if I'm saying that correctly. Hi, this is Rana from Lehi, Boston. All right. Well, Welcome. So starting with the EKG portion, So normal sinus rhythm, with narrow cuirass, no, well, this is the resting one, so I don't see any ST or T wave changes, um, at least on the get-go on this EKG. This is actually a, a signal average, so the worst case of anywhere in the strip will be demonstrated on the right of the two couplet of the couplets, so that, that what Paco is indicating. So there's a start and a worst case. Okay, so in the worst case scenario, um, I do see ST depressions, which are flat with with T wave inversions in the infralateral, lateral and inferior. And uh, as someone pointed out, there's some ST elevation in AVR as well. Excellent. So next slide. Uh, so wh wh where do you think is, 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 is the culprit vessel based on these findings? Um, I'm gonna bet on the left system, maybe box LED. Can't say, yeah. Why? Lateral. Why well, the distribution is, because I'm, I'm seeing, well, it's, it's impossible to say with ST depressions, but then I'm seeing ST elevations in AVR, that's why. Okay, uh, okay next slide. So starting from the resting images. Um, so I see fixed effect in the inferior and intro subtle territory from mid to basal segments. Um, I also see fixed defect in the septum. So and then as we look at the stress section, um, see the same defect. I don't see any reversibility um, septal and infro sep inferior region fixed defect. And so what vessel would you name in this? So these are, so I mean, it doesn't col collaborate with one territory. Okay, so, so let's move on to this, this slide and see if the attenuation correction gives us any more clarity. So most people are voting for RCA, PVA. Do you know why most people are voting for RCA? Or people can put it in the text box? Um, for the inferior ischemia now, we are seeing some reversibility in the inferior region, like the rest. Fixed defect is gone, but we can see inferior territory ischemia. Perfect. So what I'm going to repeat what Rana said just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, with the attenuation correction images, it appears now that stress is worse than rest. And so we're actually concerned about inferior ischemia. And then Rana, do you want to take a stab at why people are saying RCA rather than SERP as the etiology of the inferior ischemia? Well, I don't see any, any defect in the, the lateral or the that portion and um, it's just limited to basal mid inferior territory not extending to the infralateral region. Perfect. So that, that is true. You're not seeing anything that would also indicate an OM lesion higher up in the SERP. 
But another giveaway here, and this is very prevalent on the boards, is whenever you've got basal inferior or basal infraceptal involvement, you want to wager that that's the RCA because that predominantly subtends those areas. And then here is our uh, gated images, which have turned into a green snowstorm. Um, but what you would have seen there is lack of thickening of the inferior and infraceptal walls on the stress images. So again, consistent with that defect. I'm going to walk you through for time's sake this echocardiogram. This is resting with contrast. Um, and what I want to point out is that, one, we know that the inferior wall corrected with attenuation correction images. And now two, with our resting echocardiogram, we do not see, and I'm sorry, these are, are slightly choppy images, we do not see any hypokinesis of any of the inferior se segments, with the exception of maybe over there at the infra, uh, at the basal infraceptum. There might be a smidgen of hypokinesis at rest. And then uh, again, using our friendly reads or, that are at the bottom, what we see now is that the RAO caudal shows non-obstructive disease in the left circ, right at the ostium of the left circ there on the caudal. Then on the RAO cranial shot, we see an LAD that's got some non-obstructive disease. But on the LAO cranial shot, we see a JR catheter that does not want to stay in the ostium because there's some osteostenosis. So here's our wire, wire balloon stent. Next shot, and we see the RCA plumped up nicely there. So the take home points for this is one, there's excellent single vessel CAD correlation, inspect imaging and CAF. So anytime you have single vessel disease, you've got pretty good correlation with CAF. And two, the ECG does not co-localize culprit vessels in non-ST elevation MIs. EKGs. Oh, thank you, EKGs or, <laughs> or MIs, yeah. All right, next. Um, all right, 320. Does somebody want to take this case? I'm going to kind of keep our pace moving a little bit so we get through some more cases. I think we had a few volunteers earlier. Uh, so this, uh, Vivek, keep your eye peeled for any volunteers. So this was a 75-year-old with exertional chest pain. This was a gentleman who nine years ago came in with typical angina, positive troponins, got rushed to the cath lab, and his uh, cath showed a 20% LAD. Uh, Vivek, see if you can find me to mute for me. Um, the patient then developed some LV systolic dysfunction over the next nine years, and so came in to get a SPECT. And then, uh, is that Kevin or Kervin? It's Kervin. Kervin, all right. Kervin, you want to take this for me? Yeah, sure. Where are you uh, coming from, Kervin? Oh, I am uh, from uh, St. Luke's in Bethlehem in uh, Pennsylvania. Welcome. Um, all right, so uh, starting with the rest images here. Um, you know, you don't see any uptake in the lungs nor in the, in the, any gut uptake that could suggest uh, attenuation. There is a basal to uh, distal infero, uh, infero and infralateral defect that you can see on, uh, on the rest images. Um, and it's all throughout. And uh, it, is, it seems to be worse with uh, uh, stress, so there might be some ischemia uh, around it. So predominantly fixed minimal peri-infarct ischemia of the infralateral wall from base to mid. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a study from one of our off-campus sites, so we don't get attenuation correction on this. Okay. So uh, after this read, patient, well, well you kind of saw the next slide. We're going to cap this patient and see mm -hmm. what's going on. I mean, we would you say like uh, possibly a uh, uh, circ involvement here or, uh, yeah. Yeah, so let's take a look. Uh, 
And so it gets capped, and we don't have these pictures because they, it was capped prior to merging of the hospitals, but the cath report shows that the LAD was 40% mid, mm. but normal RCA in SERPs. Okay. So you're managing this patient, worsening heart failure, uh, now has two left heart caths with no obstructive disease, but has this fixed defect of the infralateral wall. What do you want to do next? Um, I mean, uh, it could be a, a, a microvascular disease. You could do a cardiac MR and see if there's any uh, scarring. I love it. Cardiac MR is like the fellows get out of jail free card. You can <laughs> so here's the MRI. Um, are you familiar with these? Uh, I am not really that well with it, but I can see on the short axis on the first in the basal, there is uh, a scarring on the inferolateral uh, area, and it's kind of going throughout in the same distribution. In the Beautiful. Area. And can you tell, uh, so you got the first part right, so now you get a second question. Can you tell if that is endocardial, mid-myocardial, epicardial, sub-epicardial? Can you tell where that is? So it looks like mid to epicardial. Perfect. And is that what you would expect in ischemia? Uh, no. So what is your current diagnosis bucket? And then any, anything within that that you might want to wager? I mean, it can be like uh, inflammatory. You could go with sarcoid here. Perfect. Uh, you actually hit the two diagnoses, the first two things you said. So I've either got quies well, I've either got sarcoid of the infralateral wall, that's leptic scar, or I have myocarditis of the infralateral wall. And remember, he came in with that end stemi nine years ago. Mm -hmm. So let's. Uh, so what do you want to do now? Um, I mean, uh, you can do a, 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 a technician a, a pyrophosphate scanning as well as a, um, getting AL, like you know, multi myeloma. Uh, well, I mean, sarc sarcoid. So you know, TFT testing. So. Okay. So. I'm hearing that you want to look for sarcoidosis. Yeah, sarcoidosis. So, so what is going to be your test of, of choice for that? You're getting some hints from the chat window, I can see. Uh, I mean, you can do FDG, I guess. Yeah, and, and yeah. that's really going to look for active sarcoid. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's do that. All right. Um, so on these images, I'll go ahead and read for you. You've got some uh, co-localizer up with the CMR on the top row. And mm -hmm. then on the bottom, do you see any FDG activity in the myocardium or does it look like it's all in the blood pool? Uh, I mean, I don't see any, it's not something I'm very familiar with right. until this course, but I don't see really any localization of the uptake. Beautiful. So this is blood pool. So this is a negative FDG PET for active inflammation. Mm -hmm. So now going back to your diagnoses, you said either previous myocarditis episode that left a scar mm -hmm. or sarcoidosis. Do you have a, a diagnosis you favor? I mean, at this point, I will favor uh, some uh, uh, previous uh, scarring uh, from myocarditis. Beautiful. So at this point, technically, you do still have two predominant things on your differential, either a previous episode of myocarditis that left a scar or sarcoid. But in order for this to be sarcoid, it would have to be quiescent sarcoid that left a scar without any extra cardiac manifestations. And so we think it's probably myocarditis. Great. Okay. Um, right, thank you. So that, was, that was great. And just one, one uh, comment about the presentation. It's very possible that uh, nine years before his presentation where he had this non-ST elevation in mind is when he had the episode of myocarditis with troponin elevation. Mm -hmm. okay. It's mm -hmm. very possible that's what happened. Okay. Thank you. All right. Next case. Any taker? Um, so I'm going to read the question stem while you guys are volunteering. Uh, it says 65-year-old known CAD uh, vasculopathy metabolic syndrome, coming in with postprandial chest tightness, so atypical angina, um, and don't know if she gets exertional angina because she's limited by her claudication. Next slide. So she gets a pet, and until we get a volunteer, I'll just keep going. So these are high quality images. Uh, Rana. What's Rana, great, you wanna hop in and tell me what you see on this pet? All right, um, so looking at the rest images first. Um, I don't essentially see any fixed defect at the rest images. 
and now I'm looking at the stress images, uh, you do see a significant inferior um, basal to mid region ischemia, um, which is pretty um, prominent. Yeah, uh, reversible defect in the mid to basal inferior territory. Great, and again, we see that the basal inferior wall and basal infraseptum are involved in this, so we're thinking RCA. So let's go to the next shot. <clears throat> but our, our gated images are having technical difficulties. Um, the, Rana, do you have CFR? Do you want me to take this slide? Um, I can try. So, so in C CFR uh, region at, at rest um, versus stress, you, you do see some significant decrease. It is, um, I would need help there. Great, so starting with the resting images, you did that correctly. We see resting images that are actually slightly elevated from normal. Anything above one is abnormal. That should make you think about hypermetabolic states, which could be anything from hypertension to hyperthyroidism to cancer. Um, then you look over at the stress images or the stress flows. And what you wanna see there is a stress flow that augments at least 1.8 times the resting flows. But when we look at the reserve, which is stress divided by rest, we see numbers that are overall around the 1.3 region. So we've got depressed globally myocardial flow reserves. And then when we look at our defect in particular, where we've got the red arrow sign, you see that the stress flow divided by the rest flow actually gives us a number less than one. Does anyone in, uh, in the box want to tell me what that's called? That is essentially coronary seal syndrome. That means during stress, we have less blood flow than we did during rest. And whenever you see this, there should be one diagnosis that kind of pops through your head. Do you know what that is, Rana? It's okay if not. Um, no. Well, what you should be really thinking is collateral dependent flow. So the flow to that region is dependent on collateral such that when flow has to augment, that collateral flow can no longer go there. So you should be thinking about CTOs, chronic total occlusions. And in this instance, what we see is a subtotal mid RCA lesion with very slow antegrade flow. You can argue whether or not this was the right thing to do, but on the next slide, we will see wire balloon stent and they open up well, the, the left system was... Um... Oh, the left, left system first, and you do see some left to right flow that's coming in late there, especially on the RAO caudal shot. And then on our last slide, we're going to see... Uh, the collaterals. Yeah. See the case. Thank you. So we can really help our operators, uh, our cath lab operators, whenever we see this coronary steel syndrome by giving them a heads up that you might be dealing with a CTO or a subtotal vessel. All right, great, Michael. That was awesome. Michael, um, before, you, before you go on to the next few cases, there was a general question in the chat that I think is a good one, which is in patients with known CAD uh, who then need subsequent uh, perfusion imaging, how do you decide who gets a PET and who gets a technetium spec? Right. Maybe so, you can talk about that for a minute. Right. So at our institution, um, if it's an inpatient, we all, we do PET in everyone, or at, unless exercise is, is something that you want to do. So if, if, if for whatever reason, exercise is super important uh, for the evaluation of your patient, then we would do spec for inpatients or ED patients. But for Otherwise, we would do PET on everyone because we don't have, for inpatients and ED patients, we don't have to worry about pre-certification, pre-authorization of insurance and things like that. So we would just do PET in everyone. And since we use Rubidium, we have the, gener we have the uh, generator available 24 seven. So we can do that. For our patients, on the other hand, uh, we always advise the, 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 the referring providers to order PET if possible. Obviously, if, if the BMI is greater than, in our institution, 40, so by default, they get PET, but 
we can always we can always try to get pet in everyone with a BMI less than 40. We, you make a case that, that, that the patient probably had an equivalent, an equivocal uh, spec in the past, or you're concerned for false positive findings on the spec, or, or whatever reason. You can always try to get it pet. So in, in, in our volume nowadays, is, it's almost 50 50 percent pet versus spec. Rather than having me do a fifth case, why don't we let Vivek hop in? Paco. Yeah. All right, guys, while Paco's pulling up the slides, I'll introduce myself. I'm Vivek Kulkarni. I'm one of the cardiology fellows at Penn. And uh, thank you, for Paco, for having, uh, having us involved. Um, also, it seems a little weird to talk to all you guys without saying that I hope everything is going well for all of you and uh, that you don't have to deal too much with COVID. Um, so uh, we'll start with, we'll do some cases just like Michael did. Um, and uh, if anybody wants to volunteer, please do. Uh, so uh, case number five is a 68 year old white woman with no significant past medical history. She came in for palpitations and chest pressure that has been going on for a few months. Uh, this Any volunteers? CG, uh, which baseline ECG, there's not much to interpret. It's uh, basically normal. Uh, and uh, one thing to highlight, it's uh, is it during the tachycardia. Um, thank you, guys. I understand that we may have a little bit of uh, lag here, so I'm sorry about that. Um, the uh, I think Srinivas said he could uh, help us out with this case. Um, so Srinivas, if you want to unmute. Hi, um... Hi th thanks for the opportunity. So if you can you could... hear me? Yes, we can hear you Srinivas, thank you. If you could, if you could walk us through, um, during the SVT, what do you see um, with the ST segments? There's uh, ST depression and the lateral leads. Um, V4, 5, a lot of disturbance in 6, there's ST depressions in lead 2, maybe in 3, uh, and V, and, and limb leads 2, 3, and to some extent AVF as well, with uh, probabilist elevations in AVR. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, Hello? Uh, that's exactly right. Uh, that's exactly correct. Pretty diffuse ST depressions and then ST elevations and AVR. Um, Paco, if you could then uh, go ahead to the next slide. Uh, the SVT uh, terminated 50 seconds into recovery. And in the interest of time, we won't spend too much time on the ECG itself. Uh, we'll go ahead to the next slide, Paco, which is the perfusion images. And um, Srinivas, if you could uh, walk us through what you think about these perfusion images. And I guess the first question is, do you think it's normal or abnormal? And uh, if it's abnormal, what, where is your attention being drawn to? So, uh, the rest is, uh, it looks fine. Uh, the stress, uh, the septal, posterior septal, uh, looks, uh, uh, looks, uh, looks uh, a little less intense, low counts. Um, uh, that's all I have. I mean, yeah. it's a mild perfusion defect. Uh, the very good. Yeah, there's a there's a subtle uh, mild perfusion defect in the septum. Uh, the polar maps uh, that are over on the right side also help to uh, bring that out. Mm -hmm. um, and really, that's that's basically it. Uh, Paco, if you could go on to the um, thank you, the attenuation correction images. Uh, it doesn't, you know, it, if anything, is a little bit less prominent here, but um, so that doesn't help us too much. Mm -hmm. um, 
and uh, so based on this finding alone, uh, let's see if our, I don't think our gated images will work here. Um, so basically what we concluded from this is that there is some abnormal perfusion, uh, but it was associated with ST changes during the SVT episode that happened with stress. So uh, not really clear whether that's a result of underlying coronary disease or not. Um, Paco, if you could go to the next slide, please, and, and uh, show us that uh, for, for reasons we don't have to talk about, patient ended up getting a cath. And um, hopefully the image will play through here so you can believe us, but if not, the words are at the bottom that um, basically this patient did not have any significant obstructive coronary atherosclerosis. Um, you know, some mild luminal irregularities throughout. Um, so basically our conclusion from this is that there probably was some transient hypoperfusion uh, that happened during the SVT that then was detected on the perfusion images. Um, the other possibility is that it was just an artifact. Um, and that again brings the question of how we interpret these ECG changes when someone has a supraventricular tachycardia or other arrhythmia during the stress. Um, thank you, Srinivas, for going through that. Paco, anything to add on that case? No, that's, that's excellent. And I think this is an uncommon situation, but uh, highlights the, the challenges of uh, interpreting ST changes in the setting of an uh, a tachyarrhythmia because you can have um, secondary uh, repolarization anomalies that are not necessarily related to ischemia. So, can I ask a quick question here? Yes, of course. Uh, the, the defect was, uh, which got corrected with attenuation correction was the posterior septum. So uh, my understanding was uh, if it's attenuation, it's usually from the breast or the diaphragm and uh, it's usually the posterior wall or the anterior anterolateral. So can other regions like the septum also have a problem with attenuations? The inferior septum, you can actually, the, you, you can have attenuation artifacts of the inferior septum uh, okay. because it's so, in so, such a close proximity to the diaphragm. Okay. But, uh, and, and it can actually get better with attenuation corrections, yeah. Right. But not the anterior septum, okay? Thank right. you. So let's move on to the next case. All right, thank you, Srinivas. Uh, if we could have another volunteer. Also, I, I uh, had to turn my video off, I think, to avoid the lag, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, the next case is a 50-year-old um, woman with a past medical history notable for hyperlipidemia and probably hypertension who came in with pretty typical symptoms, chest pain, dyspnea, and had a story concerning for unstable angina. Uh, she underwent a dipritamol stress test, and um, there's two ECGs here. Um, on the left is the baseline ECG, which again is pretty, um, pretty unremarkable. And um, on the right, um, I think Christopher maybe volunteered, but I, uh, Christopher, are you able to unmute? or maybe not. Um, uh, uh, so, so, so no. No, no, you volunteered, can you, uh, can you unmute for us? Sure. Well so there's some red arrows to help you, Sonal, but what do you, what do you see on the uh, ECG? Yeah. Right. So there are diffuse ST depressions, horizontal, really. In the inferior leads, V3 to V6. I'm not convinced about any elevation in AVR, at least based on this. Yeah, so, the... Um, yeah. Uh, agreed. Uh, the elevation in AVR, you know, the baseline's moving a little. It, it mm -hmm. might be there. Um, and then the other notable point is uh, below the ECGs that the patient actually experienced chest pain during the test. Um, so, Paco, if we go ahead to the next slide, here are the perfusion images. Sonal, do you want to take a shot at interpreting this, please? This is a PET study. Sure. <clears throat> so, on stress, that is uh, significant, like a large area of uh, Defect on the stress images, it's basically all the anterior and anterior lateral, uh, not the basal, like not the inferior lateral, but anterior and anterior lateral from apex to base, really also goes for the septum area. Same thing, you know, all throughout, almost uh, all the way anterior septum, a little bit uh, in the mid inferior septum, not so much in the basal inferior septum. Uh, yeah, very rest good. is fine. I mean, rest looks normal. Uh, very good, Sonal. And then um, one thing before we uh, reveal the rest of the information, what do you think about the uh, chamber size with stress and with rest? Yeah, so there is TID, at least based on visual, there is clear TID based between stress and rest. 
Yeah, very good. So here on the right are the polar maps. And as you mentioned, the rest uh, perfusion is, uh, is normal. Uh, the stress perfusion, you can see very clearly on the, so on the polar map, a, a massive defect in the, this software is actually calculating it as 67% of the myocardium. Um, and uh, as you said, there is TID. Um, the cutoffs for TID on PET, I guess, will depend from place to place, but mm -hmm. 1.37 is definitely above the cutoff we would use. Uh, these are the gated images. I'm not sure if these gated images are going to play, uh, but uh, on the right are the reported numbers of the EF, which is basically that the rest EF was normal at 56, and mm -hmm. the stress EF uh, was reduced at 40%. So, Sonal, what does that uh, suggest to yeah. you? So, normally it should augment, and this, uh, this goes in favor of ischemia, basically. You're having more dysfunction with ischemia. Uh, so, correct. Yeah. So, you know, normally the EF at least should not decrease, you know, it might, might stay the same, but um, this is definitely a very concerning finding in conjunction with all the other concerning findings. Mm -hmm. um, the last thing I'll, I'll bring up here for this case is the, the uh, coronary flow data. Yeah. So uh, what you can see here, Michael sort of talked about this for one of his cases as well. Uh, Paco has highlighted on the right side of the screen, the flow data for the um, all the different vessels and the LED territory is highlighted here that actually has a flow reserve that is less than one for the whole LED territory. And then below that is the defect map, which is similar to the LED territory, not exactly the same, but also has a flow reserve less than one, um, indicating again coronary steel that the flow is actually less at uh, stress than it is with rest, which is mm -hmm. again, very abnormal. Um, I don't think there's any question this patient needs a cath. So yeah, I mean, technically we could have argued and stopped at the EKG, I guess. <laughs> yes, technically we could have. Um, yeah. uh, here's the uh, cath. Again, I'm not sure how well these images are playing. Um, in the iliocranial view, you see that the RCA is not really anything to talk about. Um, and then the circumflex is quite big and, and with nothing significant. But the LED, you can see, obviously, there's a very tight stenosis 90-ish, 90 plus percent proximal LED stenosis. And notably, it's right before the takeoff of the first septal perforator, mm -hmm. uh, which also explains why the entire septum uh, also had significant per, uh, hypoperfusion on the MPI. Yeah. Um, and uh, here's, our, here's our wire balloon stent pictures, and there's the uh, post-PCI, post uh, very nice uh, result. Um, so just to summarize this case, thank you so much for walking us through that. Now, this is a case of a very high risk case. And so just to summarize the things we talked about, number one, ST depressions during a vasodilator stress that are greater than two millimeters. Um, the fraction of ischemic myocardium being greater than 20%. Again, in this case, it was 67. Uh, TID in this case was greater than one point. Uh, I think ours was, I think it should say greater than 1.15. Uh, yeah. And ours was greater than Ours was seven. Um, and then again, the, the EF dropped with stress and the regional flow reserve. Um, so uh, very good, thank you very much. Let's go ahead to the next case. Um, this is, uh, again, if anybody wants to volunteer, uh, please feel free. Um, case number seven uh, is a 78 year old man with known CAD with a PCI um, and a stent in the RCA remotely as well as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with an in, intracavitary gradient of 50 millimeters mercury. Um, hypertension, CKD, prostate cancer, AFib, came in with some symptoms that you saw. And here are the perfusion images uh, from a PET scan. Um, uh, Amr, is that right? I'm sorry if I'm saying that wrong. Um, That's correct. Uh, Amr, do you want to walk us through what you see here on these perfusion images? And again, the, the first question is normal or abnormal, and, and if abnormal, then, then why? Sure. So uh, the first thing that I really striking is that there's a lot of uptake, and it just looks like the walls are pretty big, just consistent with the hypertrophy. Um, the rest images look pretty good. Um, also, there's increased uptake down below, I think maybe from the gut. Um, and then stress images don't look too bad either. There's nothing really um, popping out at me. Uh, okay, great. And then one, one last question is, what do you think about the cavity size at stress and rest? There's definitely visual TID. Yeah, definitely visual TID. And then Paco just put up the numerical calculation of 1.56. Uh, 
and again, on this particular software in this particular place, the reference was less than 1.15. So definitely significant TID, uh, despite what looks like normal perfusion. I agree, Amr. Um, so if we could go ahead to the next slide, Paco. Um, this is, uh, again, I'm sorry, the gated images are not working for us. The, the gated EF was basically similar, uh, stress EF was basically similar to rest. And then here is a coronary flow uh, reserve here. Um, and what you can see on the right, um, just to highlight, this is a, this is, I know not everybody has access to this. Um, this is a pretty normal flow reserve. The resting flows are in the 0 0.5 to 0 0.6 range, which is normal. The stress flows are in the 1.3 range, which is also normal. And that gives a reserve in every territory greater than two, which is also normal. So this is a completely normal flow reserve. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the patient did have some coronary calcium seen on the CT. We knew already about a stent in the RCA. Uh, but in addition to that, there's a coronary calcium seen in the LED distribution. So I guess the question at this point is, you know, what do you do, Amr, with this patient who, here you can see the echo, um, obvious LVH related to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, what looks on echo like a, a normal or hyperdynamic EF, normal perfusion, normal flow, but a TID that it's very significantly elevated. Yeah. Um, do we have like a coronary artery calcium score? Uh, we don't have a numerical score, unfortunately. Okay. But it's, it's likely over 400. Yeah, I mean, I guess maybe, you know, the wall motion looks good too, but it could, I would, I guess I would probably lean towards medical management, but then in the back of my mind, I'm also thinking if there's maybe balanced ischemia, if we have TID, or if there's... Um, yeah, that would yeah, good. Great, great idea. So, you know, obviously TID is one of the things we get concerned about is multivessel ischemia. Uh, this patient did undergo a cath. Um, and again, as you can see with the helpful summaries, um, there's really no significant obstructive CAD here. The RCA stent is not very well seen on these pictures, but is uh, patent and, um, you know, some luminal things, but nothing obstructive. Um, so if you uh, go on to the next slide, Paco, uh, basically, what this uh, summarizes nicely is that, um, you know, we think of TA TID in the setting of abnormal perfusion as indicative of severe ischemia or multivessel CAD, like in our patient with, um, in our patient with the proximal LAD lesion. In this case, we have TID in the presence of normal perfusion. And uh, usually that uh, it can be seen in people with moderate to severely increased LV wall thickness uh, of any kind, uh, you know, hypertensive uh, LVH, um, genetic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, even in amyloid heart disease where it's not uh, muscular hypertrophy, but infiltrative. Um, and there's a study cited down here in 2016 that Paco very uh, selflessly did not put that he's the lead author on, uh, that found that about 52% of patients with HCM have an abnormal TID. And here's some nice images from that study where you basically see the cavity size enlarge uh, with stress. And you know, uh, on the slide we put here that it, it should be sort of considered an artifact in the sense that it is probably not the case that there is true uh, enlargement of the LV cavity during systole, as is the case with um, TID with abnormal perfusion. It's more likely related to subendocardial hypoperfusion that occurs in these patients uh, because the LV mass or abnormal microvasculature. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have the same prognostic implications as it does in people who have TID with coronary disease. Uh, Paco, anything you want to add about this? No, that was perfect. Great. So, yeah, so, so basically, uh, I guess I just want to emphasize that uh, don't overread TID when the perfusion is normal, okay? So if the perfusion is completely normal, you see TID, especially uh, with after exercise or in bed, see everything else what's going on, look at the flow, Look at the echo if the patient has significant LVH because if the patient has significant LVH, it's probably related to 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 um, increased wall thickness rather than um, balanced ischemia, which is the main concern that we all have. So 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 that's kind of the the teaching the main teaching point of this case. Great, uh, thank you, Amr, for volunteering. And if we could have one more volunteer for this uh, this case number eight, um, this is a 47 year old man who had a history of. CAD with multiple prior stents, five prior stents that you can see listed here, as well as uh, risk factors for CAD. 
uh, who came in with atypical back pain. And uh, if we go to the next slide, um, these are the perfusion images. Um, does anybody want to take a shot at interpreting this? Haven't seen any volunteers, so if not, that's okay. Uh, maybe in the interest of time, I'll, I'll keep going here. So yeah. in the non-AC, this is a spec uh, study, in the non-AC images, uh, what you can see here is a, uh, what looks like an inferior perfusion defect that's more predominant toward the base, and then also a uh, primarily fixed with a little bit reversible uh, perfusion defect in the, antero, in the distal anteroseptum. Um, nothing, uh, these are the uh, attenuation corrected images. Um, the defect actually looks less obvious on these images and the attenuation introduces a large defect that was not there on the, uh, on the non-AC images. So this study was read as primarily fixed defects in the distal anteroseptum and the basal inferior wall. Nothing was done and unfortunately the patient continued with symptoms. Um, and a couple months later, I think it was two months later, uh, the patient then went on to have a pet. Um, so here is a pet of the same patient uh, just two months later. And uh, this is obviously a much more pronounced study uh, with what now looks like basically normal resting perfusion and pretty significant reversible ischemia, uh, primarily in the inferior wall from uh, mid to base, uh, also extending into the infralateral wall. Um, with a little bit maybe in the inferoseptum. Uh, and again here, the calculated amount of ischemic myocardium according to the PET software was 30%, uh, whereas I think on the prior spec, it was around 10%. And again, the territories are also different now. This uh, sort of larger area was not really picked up in the spec. So if, uh, if we could go on to the next slide, Paco. And a slight TID as well. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry about that. Visually it looks like slight TID. Do we have the number on the TID? 1.32. 1.32. Oh, perfect. There it is. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so some TID as well. And so again, these are findings which were not seen on the spec. Um, gated images, again, are not working. Apologize for that. But, the but there was no augmentation of the ejection fraction is kind of the main thing. Correct. And um, what we can see here on the flow reserve data is that the, um, if you look here, the resting flow looks pretty normal. But both in the RCA territory and in the circumflex territory, the reserve is you know, around 1.3, which is definitely abnormal. And if you go down a little further to the defect map, the flow reserve of the defect itself is 1.05, so approximately one, which is again, very abnormal. I suppose it's not technically coronary steel since it's above one. Um, and then Paco has just highlighted here very nicely the differences in the polar maps between SPECT and PET for the same patient. Uh, at roughly the same time in the disease, that the area detected by PET is much larger, both quantitatively and in terms of the location of the ischemia detected. So the patient did go on to get a cap in this case, uh, which showed that the RCA had a chronic total occlusion and that there was a pretty tight, uh, thank you, Paco, pretty tight proximal lesion in the circumflex. It's uh, called 95%. Uh, and the LED was you know, some minimal irregularities. The patient did undergo revascularization of the circumflex. Uh, so the, the take home points from this is basically that um, PET has much better sensitivity for uh, detecting flow limiting CAD and especially in multi-vessel CAD. Uh, and there's a reference here listed uh, that shows the sensitivity of SPECT is about 48% and uh, PET is about 72%. So definitely significantly better. Excellent job. Um, so I think we have five a minute. So I think we have, let's see, we can actually do all cases that we have. So we have two more to go. Michael. I have a blank screen. Uh, Serena Voss, the answer to your question is that PET is likely able to detect the multivessel disease better than SPECT due to the increased spatial resolution of the tracer because it's ejecting particles in both directions. Um, I was typing that and now I'm talking. All right, so case nine, I'm gonna go ahead and do this case. Um, if anyone wants to have a peppering of questions, just go ahead and volunteer. So this is a 71 year old who got a heart transplant five years prior for sarcoid related cardiomyopathy. And as part of his routine surveillance, 
three years after his heart transplant had a coronary uh, angiography done that was consistent with no transplant arteriopathy. Then over the next two years, he starts to develop this non-productive cough, especially at night, and he needs to be screened again for his transplant, but now his creatinine is up to 2.5, and so uh, we have opted him out of the angiography pipeline, and he's now in the stress pipeline for routine surveillance. Um, and here is his uh, stress rest PET images, and what you'll see is that there is a fixed defect involving the apex and distal inferior infraroceptum. However, the global peak myocardial blood flow is 2.6, which is actually quite robust. For heart transplants, the reference normal value is 1.7. Uh, he also has a normal EF at this point and uh, normal filling pressures on his right heart cath. So there was a discussion with the heart transplant team and heart failure in the end decided not to pursue angiography and we can talk about why that is in a moment, to look for uh, transplant arteriopathy and instead wanted to just surveil. And they did so with a repeat PET uh, almost a year later, which you'll see again shows the same fixed defect in that sort of unusual distribution of distal inferior, distal infraroceptum and apex. However, the global peak myocardial blood flow, again, was quite robust at 2.7. So, it turns out that the negative predictive value for transplant arteriopathy, if you have a peak blood flow greater than 1.7, is about 98%. Transplant arteriopathy tends to involve all of the vessels, not just distinct lesions. And so, despite the fact that there was this fixed defect, the team did not think that he had transplant arteriopathy because the global blood flow was so robust. However, for the cough, he got a CT chest that shows these tree and bud opacities with a little uh, circumferential ground glass with our lovely cardiologist red arrow sign there, which the radiologists were concerned was sarcoid. And so at this point, the heart team orders an FDG PET, where we have a great deal of FDG avidity corresponding with our fixed ammonia perfusion defect. And so this uh, was a rare case of recurrence of sarcoidosis. And actually, uh, yeah, it's, it's very rare in the literature. It's very challenging to diagnose. You have to have a high index of suspicion. But the take-home points for you on this is Transplant arteriopathy is a diffuse process. Your myocardial blood flow at stress will be almost certainly dropped in this process. And so if you have a robust or even normal myocardial blood flow with stress, it virtually rules out transplant arteriopathy. And a lot of centers are experimenting with this as the screening for transplant arteriopathy rather than routine angiography. Dr. Garbala, I see you popped on. Did you have something All to right. Uh, Dr. Dorbala, um, do we have time for an extra for the last case or should we? It's uh, four o'clock, so I just okay. want to be respectful of everyone's okay. times. And uh, thank you very much, Paco and your team. Uh, Michael and Vivek, excellent cases, really great job. Uh, you covered the entire spectrum of myocardial viability and showed a number of interesting cases, including HCM and transplant cardiomyopathy. So thank you very much. I uh, just wanted to be respectful of everyone's sure. time here. So see you all tomorrow. All right, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Right, thank you. Thank you.